today is kind of be an overview um, of how we got where we are in part, but I thought it would be really appropriate for the University of Maine to participate with us to talk to you a little bit about hydrogeomodeling. Modeling. I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Johnson, who, uh, Scott, are you still the chair? He's the chair of the uh, School of Earth and Climate Sciences at the University of Maine, and he'll introduce Andy. Uh, and any time you would like um, to come to the University of Maine, to the School of Earth and Climate Sciences, uh, we'd be deli delighted to have you. And as Senator Saviello knows, we um, can get a group of people around and uh, provide as much information as we can on the science associated with issues such as groundwater modeling uh, and mining. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be accompanied by uh, Professor Andy Reeve. Andy's been in the School of Earth and Climate Sciences for a little bit longer than me, a few years anyway. I've been there for 16 years, and Andy a few years more than that. And Andy is our uh, specialist in groundwater uh, flow and groundwater modeling. He's a hydrogeologist. Uh, he works extensively in peat lands, uh, in other uh, areas in Maine, uh, wetlands, but he's also got uh, other uh, research uh, programs that span different parts of the globe. Uh, he's uh, an internationally recognized expert in what he does, and I believe what he's going to do for you today uh, is to provide a, a, a very elementary overview of uh, hydrogeology, uh, just to get the ball rolling on this topic. In the, in the event that you would like any further uh, uh, interactions with us, again, we would be delighted to do so. And so as Scott said, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of a basic introduction to hydrogeology, just to provide people with the, uh, some information about the jargon used in hydrogeology <coughs> and what wells are used for in hydrogeology. Um, and so the first little bit of jargon that gets thrown around in hydrogeology is hydraulic head. Right? Hydraulic head is a basic parameter in hydrogeology. It's the measure of the energy that water has. And it's used to figure out the directions of flow in the subsurface. So people put a well in like this, and they measure the water level. And in this case, the water level in the well is actually above the surface of the well. It's flowing out of that well over time. It's down in Acadia. And uh, somebody that really wanted to figure out the energy that the water had would need to put a riser on that and figure out the level of the water in that system. So when we think about hydraulic head, this is what you might picture. You put a well in. There's a water level in that well, and hydraulic head is simply the level of the water, the measure of potential energy in that, in that well. And when you put a well in, there will be an opening in that well somewhere in that interval. So in this case, the little hatch lines at the bottom of it, that might be a cut screen in a well. That's pretty typical in environmental monitoring wells. And that's where you're making measurements. It's almost like measuring the temperature of meat, right? You put a thermometer in there, you're not measuring it at the surface, you're measuring the temperature of the tip of the meat thermometer. The same thing is happening here. You're measuring the water potential at a discrete point or zone in the subsurface. And you do the same thing when you collect chemical data. Right? You put a well in, you're not measuring it at the surface, you're measuring at a very small zone in the subsurface. And that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. So there's some other jargon on here, but Again, that level of water is what's used to figure out the flow directions in the subsurface. And the other jargon people use in hydrogeology relates to the different units in the subsurface that control the movement or influence the movement of water and hold that water. So we have different types of aquifers. People can talk about a confined aquifer. A confined aquifer has some kind of a unit at the surface that impedes flow, that slows the flow down in the, in the subsurface and basically uh, traps the pressure or uh, alters the pressure in that zone below the confining unit. And then we have unconfined aquifers that are bounded at the top by the water table, right? the, the top of the layer of water in the subsurface. And if we stick wells in those different units and measure the water levels, and you can see they're going to have different levels in those wells, and we can figure out the direction of flow just by comparing the levels. So in the diagram shown there, and you need to compare apples with apples, right? You, in the diagram, the well is on the left. There's a deep well and a shallow well. The deep well has a higher water level in it than the shallow well. And so in that position, and the same is true on the right, and I can do that myself here, so. Uh, you want to borrow this one, Andy? How about so? this? 
So over here. Is that the wise right, guy in the back row right pointing? There. Hey, yes. <laughs> I have him removed. Right, right there. Uh, that's okay. Um, so right there, we're measuring water level there. We're measuring water level right there, right? And there's a difference in the potential. And so in that case, water is flowing down, right? It's going into the ground. The water level at the surface is higher than the water level in the deep well. So therefore, the water's got to be moving vertically downward. And if we compare the shallow wells, that well versus that well, the water level on the right has a lower water level. So the water is also moving from left to right. Okay, and you can go down here if we compare apples with apples and just look at the two wells in the confined aquifer, right? The water level in the left is higher than the water level in the right. So in the confined aquifer, water is also moving from left to right. So it's three-dimensional flow. It's not a bathtub down there. Things are moving around. They're moving up and down. They're moving north-south. They're moving east-west in the subsurface. And to figure out where something like contaminant is going to go, you need to measure the hydraulic head and figure out the flow direction. Just Andy, just on the, let me see on the, on the one all the way to the right, do you, do you say the water level is lower than the other shallow well to the left, yep. correct? Okay. So and so the water will be flowing down, we expect it to be flowing downhill. In this case. Yes, yep. but yep. in other so, cases it might not. So that is one way to think about it. Water, uh, not entirely correct, but water flows from high head to low head. It flows downhill if the pressure will not get to... That's all right, it is so, simple right now. Yep. So. So the water level's there. You can see the little triangle indicating the water level. The water level here is being measured here. Okay, so it's going from that well screen down across the confining layer to that well screen. So again, this just this notion that things are moving in three dimensions: They're moving left, north, south, east, west, up and down across that across that system. Okay, so let's get rid of that. So what controls, once we figure out the flow direction, how do we figure out how fast things are moving? Okay. And there are two parameters, two things that control the rate that move, the water moves. So why would you want to know that? If a gas station spills some gasoline and you want to figure out how fast it's going to get to the water supply or a river or something like that, you want to know the, the rate of flow so you can maybe figure out how much time you had to remediate this system. So the two things that control flow are the hydraulic gradient and the hydraulic conductivity. Okay? Hydraulic gradient is... <laughs> so Memorize there, that, there you go. Everybody can read that. Is a, again, a three-dimensional property. That's what that long equation down there says. It says that there's a gradient, there's a potential in the left, right, uh, north, south, east, west, and up, down directions that are driving the flow, just like we said with the hydraulic head. Right? And we're going to simplify this and just assume things move in one dimension drive home a couple of a couple of points here. Okay. So we put our wells in, we measure our head difference. You all know now if I give you a quiz that stuff can go, it's going to go from left to right in that particular diagram, right? Because of the head differential. The gradient is the slope of the line. Right? And it's not going to be a nice straight line in a real system. It's going to curve all over the place. But at a point, if you fit a, a line touching that point, the slope of that line is the gradient, right? And the steeper the gradient, the greater the driving force pushing water around in the subsurface. Okay, so again, measuring the wells and the hydraulic heads gives you that kind of information. Okay. The other part of the equation in figuring out the rates that water moves around in the subsurface is the hydraulic conductivity. And the hydraulic conductivity is effectively a measure of the ease with which a fluid moves through the subsurface. So that's going to change with different materials. It's not going to be uniform in the subsurface. It's going to vary, just like I showed in the previous diagram. And it's controlled both by the fluid properties and the, uh, and the material properties. So in, in essence, this is if, if the fluid properties are the same, which in most places they are, right? just dealing with fresh water. The only thing that's really varying is the permeability. So it's a surrogate for permeability of the rock. And if we tie those two things together, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So I've got a slide here from some data from a USGS open file report. And I put this up here just to show how different the hydraulic conductivities are in different materials. So that spans something like 
nine orders of magnitude. There's a nine billion fold, a one billion fold change in the material properties depending on what you're, what you're in. Are you in sand? Are you in clay? There's a huge change in the, in the ability for that material to transmit water. And so again, if we put these things together, we can come up with a, a relationship that describes the flow rate. In this case, Q, big capital Q, is a flow rate. K is the hydraulic conductivity. DH, DX is the gradient we just talked about. And then A is the cross-sectional area that the water is moving through. So Q is a discharge, the volume of water moving across an area, driven by the hydraulic gradient, and kind of regulated by the hydraulic conductivity I should mention a couple of other things here. So I've got a few little notes down there at the bottom. Um, Darcy's Law assumes water's moving slow. Kind of an assumption in there, which is true in most groundwater situations. And I've got this note here, sample scale REV. So to measure hydraulic conductivity, it's going to be scale dependent. If you take a small block of rock and measure the hydraulic conductivity, it's going to be different than taking a block of rock much bigger, but also includes that little block of rock. It's going to change as we change the scale that we make those measurements. So when you go out and sit wells in the ground, it's important to again keep that in mind that you're measuring at a point, and if you try to average over a much larger scale, you might get a different number than you get at a single point. Okay, so that's your rate, and then we can do some other manipulations to Darcy's Law and come up with what most people are really interested in, which is this. That's your velocity. Right? If you want to calculate a rate that a contaminant or something in the water is moving around, that velocity is, uh, I'm taking a second looking at this because I've got a little circle around it and yours, that screen's not showing it, so I'll just turn that off. That velocity is the true rate of flow. It's an average rate of flow. Water in these little porous network of material in the subsurface, moving that way and that way at a micro scale, and we average those different velocities, and we get that term, this average linear velocity in the subsurface. And it's also including another parameter, a porosity term. So to get the velocity, you need three things. Porosity, hydraulic conductivity or permeability, and the hydraulic rate be able to measure the rates that things are moving around in the subsurface. Okay. So uh, I put this in here because I saw on the internet there was some literature that had potentiometric surfaces in it. A potentiometric surface is just an imaginary surface of hydraulic head. We put our wells in, we put an infinite number of wells in and connected all the water levels, we'd get a potentiometric surface. Okay. So let's take a step up. Let's go from one dimension to two dimensions. How do you figure out flow direction in multiple dimensions, which is what we're really after, right? We want to be able to evaluate the direction of groundwater flow so we can make predict predictions about contaminant movement, which I think is what most people are interested in, okay? So to do that, we need to define a surface. And that's sort of the minimum number of wells to define a surface are three. We need three wells, three hydraulic heads in the same unit to define a plane. Put those three wells and you can then come up with a flow direction, okay? So we need three points. It's important to note that those wells need to be in the same unit, right? You can't just put them in willy-nilly. They have to be all in the water table or all in the same confined aquifer or somewhere. They need to be in the same unit and they need to be positioned in a way that there isn't something in between them that's screwing up groundwater flow. If you want to define a plane and there's a pumping well in between your wells, that's not going to cut it. You want to define the flow direction and there's a big hole in the middle of your system, that's not going to cut it. They need to be in the same system that's unperturbed, okay, or a, a side of the system that isn't being influenced by something that's perturbing the flow. Or do it before the, the disturbance is made where you go out and you put those in, determine which way it's going to go. So let's, let's, let's take the well example. So if I have a well, and I put three wells around it, that's not going to give me a flow direction, a very good one, okay? If I have my well in and off to the side I put three wells, then I can figure out a flow direction. It'll show water moving toward the well. Okay? So it can't be in between those, those different wells. Okay? 
<clears throat> and so typically what a hydrogeologist does when they want or the first step in evaluating a site is to put in sets of wells to figure out the flow direction. Everything else is, if you don't know the flow direction and you find something in the ground you're interested in, you don't know where it's going. You don't know where it came from. You can't say anything about it other than that it's there. Right? You find contamination next to the gas station, well, maybe the gas station didn't make it. Maybe it came from somewhere else. So you need to know the flow direction to be able to say anything about contamination in the subsurface. So we put our three wells in. We go out to our site, we put in our three wells in the same unit. The screens are all in the same unit. And then we measure the water levels in them. And I've got little numbers there. And I put the water levels in. And the reasoning then that goes in there is to try to draw a line that represents a line of equal hydraulic head, a so-called equipotential. Okay? And on that diagram, 112.46 comes, comes between 112.54 and 112.37. So we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume the things behave nice and smoothly, and we're going to interpolate and figure out by interpolation where 112.46 is on kind of a little scale between the, the well to the left and the well to the right, right, these two wells. And we do that. We connect our little, like make a little triangle out of this. I figure out that at that point, based on interpolation, we have a value of 112.46. We draw a line, right? That's an equipotential at the line of equal hydraulic head across our system. Water goes from high head to low head. On this diagram, high head is above the line and low head is below the line, so it's got to be going down. And just like in the surface, water flows perpendicular to contour lines on a topographic map, water is going to flow perpendicular. All things, all, all other things being equal, we'll contradict this in a minute. They're going to flow perpendicular to that line. So we can figure out a flow direction from that, right? It's going to flow in the direction that the arrow shows on that diagram from that information. Okay? Okay. The complication to this is variability in the subsurface. As I said, hydraulic conductivity varies all over the place in the subsurface. And we can have heterogeneity. That just means that things are different at different points. And importantly, we can have anisotropy, which people might not be familiar with. And anisotropy, so this is heterogeneity. Circle is small here. That represents a small hydraulic conductivity. Here it's small. There it's really big. Right? So we have heterogeneity in the system. This is anisotropy. Right? Here, the little vectors, little arrows, all have the same length. They make a little circle. The properties are all the same in all the different directions. Down here, they're not. So the hydraulic conductivity is bigger in the horizontal direction than the vertical direction. Okay? And you need to figure that out to be able to really say something about uh, the flow directions. So that's going to interact with the, the, the gradient to shunt flow in different directions. Okay? So in that diagram, I've got a bunch of fancy stuff on there that I use in my class. But you've got dashed lines, diagonal dashed lines right here and here that are the hydraulic that are the equipotentials. And that blue line is in the direction of the hydraulic gradient, right? perpendicular to the equipotentials. And I've got a little ellipse on there to represent the anisotropy. Well, that's going to impact the flow direction, and it's going to shunt it in the direction of higher flow. So the hydraulic conductivity, and all these things are playing together to drive the direction that water moves in the subsurface. So I'm going to finish up here with a little conceptualized cross-sectional diagram of flow. Uh, I, I'm going to then show an image of the subsurface that I collected at UMaine, uh, somebody else collected at UMaine, that kind of derives from this idea of heterogeneity. And then I'm going to show a little computer model to, do, and to try to drive some of these points home. So in a cross-section in Maine, we have a hill, we have a little stream somewhere. In wet areas like Maine, the water table is typically, at least at big scales, a subdued replica of the topography. And so if we just go out, we don't know anything else, we look at a big landscape in the topography, we can make a crude, poorly informed guess of the direction the groundwater flow is moving. Okay? So we look at our topography in that diagram and we make our crude assumption. Right? Water is going to be a subdued replica of the of the topography, 
and we're going to draw in here some boundaries. And this is critical in groundwater modeling, right? Boundaries control ultimately the flow from the system. If you put in crummy boundary conditions in your model, you're going to get garbage out. Okay. So in this case, I put some crummy boundaries in here. I've made some assumptions here. At the top, right, we've got a divide here, right? If you envisioned a raindrop falling to the left and right of that, they'd go in different directions. That's kind of the concept of a hydraulic divide. Water is not going to flow across that. It's going to go to the left or the right. It's not going to flow across it. And over here, you can think of the same thing. Like water, drop that hits the left or right of that, it's going to flow toward that but not cross it. So again, it's kind of a hydraulic no-flow barrier. And then I've arbitrarily drawn in a no-flow barrier at the bottom. There's a confining layer there that impedes flow. So I assume it's a no-flow barrier. And from that information, I can draw a diagram that illustrates the flow. Just from that, that's how a model works. It does this in a much more sophisticated way, but it puts these boundary conditions in. The top I've drawn in is the water table. That defines the hydraulic potential. That defines the driving force. And then there's no flow boundaries everywhere else. And so based on that, what direction is a water droplet that lands right there going to go? I'll quiz everybody. To the pond. OK, it's going to go to the pond, but how can it? Because it's a no flow barrier. It can't move to the left or the right. It's, it's got to go down. That's the only thing it can do, right? It can't go to the left or the right. Got to go to the pond somehow because that's the lowest hydraulic potential in the system. So it's going to go down, and there's our first flow line, the dash line. It'll move around just like that. And we can kind of go from there and draw in the rest of the flow line. That, again, that's a kind of a crude way of thinking about it. The boundary conditions define the flow. And once I draw in the flow lines, I can draw in the extra potentials. Right, they've got to get a right angle to flow, like we said before. And now those are uh, equipotentials on here. And if I stuck a well in and it went right there, how high would the water go? Well, we follow our equipotential <coughs> back to the water table. That's where we actually know the water level. It would rise up to right there. Okay, so all that information gives you a sense for the flow directions in that, in that particular system. So, so let me see if I can ask this question. And maybe I'll wait. I'll ask it. If I were putting a monitoring well looking for contaminant, and I did not put it in the right location, thinking, well, it's all going downhill, and I put it in a position to capture, I could miss the contaminant. So you, and I was going to make this point later, but you cannot just put a single well in and expect to capture the contamination or characterize the groundwater flow. You need to put clusters of wells in, and they need to have screens that are discrete, that cover a discrete interval. So you're measuring a single little zone. People do that for two reasons. One is to measure the hydraulic head in the zone. And in, back in the 80s, I used to do environmental consulting. I remember back in the 80s, people put in these enormous wells, fully slotted, thinking that if contamination fl flowed in, they would capture it. That is nonsense. You just dilute your contamination down to nothing. And you don't see any contamination. Yet, right? So you need to put them in discrete zones, both to capture the chemistry at a point and the hydraulic head at a point. And then from there, you can start saying something about the flow direction and make intelligent guesses about where you should put in groundwater monitoring wells. So you would want to put a cluster in near the hill to make sure that water's flowing down, that something crazy isn't going on and it's coming up. Or by the, the river over here, you'd put a bunch of wells in and you'd see as you drill deeper, the water levels would get higher and higher in your wells because the water's coming up. This is an image of a well that you made. Okay, I've got some wells in for teaching students how to do some of this stuff. And it's got three, this was collected by a company in Bangor called Northeast Geophysical. But they've, and they come out and use my wells to uh, test their equipment out to make sure they're working properly. So we're doing stuff for other people too. But um, so there's three logs here. We're just going to look at two. There's this, that's the so called caliper log. That just measures the diameter of the well. That's an image based on sound wave being bounced off the edge of the well. So they drop a tool down the hole, and a sound wave comes out and is reflected back, and they make a picture from that return, the time it takes the signal to go. And the one to the right is an actual picture of the well. So we've taken the well, which is a circle, right? We've captured an image all the way over, and then we've unrolled it and made an image. Really nice, simple direction. You can put in wells and easily characterize things. But in Maine, most of the bedrock 
That's true in a place like a sand and gravel, but in the bedrock, you've got to deal with fractures. Right? There are cracks in the rock. When you stick your drinking water well in, the water isn't flowing in all down the side of the well. It's coming in at discrete zones. And if we look at this image, let's just scroll down. Right? You can see the variability in the subsurface. There's a fracture. Right? There's a crack in the rock. The caliper's deflecting out and getting bigger. And you can see it in the two pictures. Right? There's a change. And then we come down, and that's actually a flat fra fracture. So this will get kind of complicated, but we take our image, cut it in half, and then unroll it, and it's flat. It's a flat surface. Okay? We keep going down here, and you see these squiggly lines. Those are just layers in the rock. And let's find a nice fracture here. There's some disking in the... But again, illustrates the variability. All these layers are in a 200-foot column of rock, and somewhere in here there's a really nice fracture. There's one right here, related to this structure. You can see it right here. Those are potentially the only places that water. Here, water, no water's coming in. It's solid, competent rock, or very little water's coming in. What's the scale? Uh, these are feet. So that's, we're at 177 feet down here. And here you're starting to see breaks in the rock here and a fracture in here and it's being picked up a little bit by the caliper. There's a really nice one in here. There, there it is, right? So big deflection in the caliper, this crazy S-shaped thing. Well, if you think about that, you take your hole and you slice it at an angle and you unwrap it to get an S-shape. So that's what, so you've got these fractures. They're not just flat. They're moving in all these different directions. And to characterize that, again, you need to put in multiple wells. You need to put them in different depths. You can't just put a single well in and expect to capture the flow direction. You certainly can't expect to capture the contamination. That's that. And the last thing, the title was modeling, so I felt compelled to at least show some crude modeling here. And uh, this is a very simple little applet that the USGS has made. You can go on their website and download this and run it in the web browser yourself if you want to. It's, uh, I can provide people with a reference for that if they want. But what we're going to do here is what we did with the conceptualized model I did before. Right? I'm going to start my little model, extremely simple, put in my modeled domain. And we're going to zoom out here. There we go. So there's their model. And it's exactly the same as what I showed before. Right? No flow boundaries on the black lines. And we're going to draw in the water table. Okay? So I draw in the water table. Hit my little button here. And I sketch in. And let's do something similar. Let's say there's a hill coming down to a stream. There's a little floodplain, the dip in the surface, then the floodplain. And it starts coming, oh, that's not good. And it starts coming back up. And there's our water table, right? Crudely drawn in. And now we want to look at the flow regime. So most models are going to take the boundary conditions and they're going to mesh it some. They're going to take it and they're going to break it up into little cells. And they're going to calculate the hydraulic head using some fancy math at each little cell in the model. So let's do that. Let's hit mesh. Put in a number of columns. I'm going to put in too many here. <clears throat> Hit OK, and it meshes it. Right? So with all those little cells, we're going to calculate the hydraulic head. So it took these they're little tiny cells all across there, 60 by 40 array of cells, and it's taken the boundary condition and it's calculated the hydraulic head. And that's based on data that you would have theoretically plugged into the yep. system. So somebody that really wanted to do this for, for a site has to figure out what the boundary conditions are. And then they have to go measure the hydraulic conductivity at all the different points. And we're going to change that in a minute here to show the impact of that. And they need to, you know, there's all kinds of other information in a real model. You'd want to know recharge rates, how much rain, and evaporation, and all sorts of stuff. Going so, so in essence, someone would have gone out and driven wells, probably in these, in the various fractures that were identified, to draw that hydraulic map. Well, I would, I would advocate, if I were going to go out and evaluate a site, I would do I would do the model first. Right? I would go out and say, I have, I know the topography, 
I'd collect whatever information I could that's already available and make a model and run it and use that to guide where the future wells are going to be. And make some estimate. And then I'd put my wells in and I'd find out that my model's wrong. And I'd revise it and improve it and make a better model. And I'd do that iteratively until I came up with something that was reasonable. It's so never going to get perfect. Models are not reality. They are a pale reflection of reality. So you got to take them with a grain of salt. But I, I don't think a lot of people want to use models to make predictions, right? And we see that with weather forecasts. People make these predictions. It's going to snow tomorrow, and then there's no snow. Or it's not going to snow tomorrow, and then we're semis are sliding off the road, right? Models are only as good as the data that goes into them. In that case, a lot of times the data changes over time. Here, it's extremely complicated. The subsurface is extremely complicated. Getting enough information to make a decent model is going to vary from site to site. Some are going to be simpler than others. First, first you model the site. You're trying to figure out where you're going to put a monitoring well that's going to monitor for who knows how many years. I assume you have to put down some test wells to figure out what's going on underneath to know where to put that final monitoring, monitoring well. So, right. So, um, at least around landfills, typically people will put in wells initially, figure out a flow direction, and then they'll put in additional wells down gradient to where you would expect the contamination to be moving to make that monitoring call. No. Yeah, I'm thinking yeah. on a mining site. You need to know what's going yeah. on underground. Yeah. So somehow you have to go down there and find out. Yeah. And that's just temporary to know what the soil is, what the... The wells, if you spend the money to put a well in, you should leave it there. Okay. Right? You should, they're expensive to put in. Somebody's going to have to cut trees down in, in, at these mining sites. Okay. Right? They're going to have to, you should put them in and leave them there. The tests people do with wells are, they do three different things with a monitoring well. And probably more, but... Uh, they measure the hydraulic head and figure out flow directions from that array of wells, right? So you get your flow direction. You can do a test called a, a, a piezometer test on the well and measure the permeability around the well. So you get your hydraulic conductivity of each of your individual wells, and then you can get water chemistry data to see if there's contamination there. Those would be the three different things you can do, tests you can do on the well. How do you know what's going on underground? Uh, you know what's at the surface. You uh, put your well in. Okay. And, you and that will be a final monitoring well, or you sure or you have some kind of test well ahead of time. But the question is more: how, how do you judge where to begin to put the wells? Where do you? I don't think there's an answer to that. You have to go. You have to get information to guide your future actions. And so the first thing to do is to stick. As you, I guess what you're saying: you put some wells in first, make measurements. And then from there, you've got it. You can make an educated guess. Your first call, other than what we did before, and say that the landscape is roughly related to the subsurface topography, and maybe look around and hope somebody else has put a monitoring well in, and you can get some information to kind of inform your decisions. You have to drill some basic wells initially, roughly figure out the flow directions, figure out what your problem is. Your mind's going to go in here. I want to know what's going to happen around that. I'm going to put in wells down gradient. I'm going to preferentially put in wells down gradient of that based on my information. Or I put my wells and I'm going to do them my borehole geophysics, which is what I showed earlier, and figure out where all the fractures are. And then I go in and put wells in all those fractures. If you're in an extremely permeable system, right. dyes are great. If you're in a place where there are big voids in the subsurface and stuff's moving quickly. Well, keep, yeah, but keep in mind where we are, there's no granite. There's basalt. And, and there is a default, but, but once you get to a certain point... Where are we at? You think are we doing a generic talk, or are we doing... Arista County, Northwest. Okay, so and, we're talking and about... And so, depending what side of Route 11 you happen to be, you're either, if you go east of that, then you're in potato land, and they got the good soil. And if you go west, then you're on either a rock bed, uh, and, and, or you're in muck. Well, there's volcanic rocks on the west. Are we uh, talking about uh, Bald Mountain, or are we talking yeah. about the yeah. mountain? West of well, Lebanon. I mean, Bald Mountain Shore, that's an example. East of that is uh, Paleozoic slates, and actually the far west is more Paleozoic rocks, uh, bedded uh, metasedimentary rocks. But there's a whole sequence of volcanic yeah. rocks in there. So there's still going to be fractured right. bedrock. That, I mean, the, the rocks I showed earlier are similar to what Bob, I think, is talking about. Probably more highly metamorphosed. But <coughs> 
they get plates and sandstones yeah. that have been be altered fractured. by heating yeah. pressure. What John was just missed in the beginning is that even in these tight bedrocks, right, there are there's fractures, fractures that water moves into. Well, you could hire somebody that does geophysics. From the geophysics, the surface geophysics that I've seen, you need some kind of ground truth to really make <clears> sense <throat> of the data. So you need to have at least one well, and then you do your geophysics around it, and you can interpret that data better, right, the, the geophysical data. What, what if you were to circle the site? with a 10-foot ditch. Does, does that prevent the possibility of it going no. elsewhere? No. It's only going to intercept it, the shallow it, it, What you right? missed the beginning, it yeah. shows that water can act. And that's the point that we're well, trying to Well, that water there, you can see. You can it's see going that. down. So right, if you, you put your... go down and then come back up. If you put your ditch here, and your contamination is right here, it's going to go underneath it. And then come back up near the stream, so but Andy, I think it's important when you say you do, if I, if I have this right, you do a preliminary map, which is you're, you're not doing the final map for somebody unless you got extremely lucky in this right. this first shot. This it's is iterative. A first, it's iterative. Put your wells in. Or then you go your out there and say, to, uh, yeah. assess your data, put some more wells in. You, you're just, not going to just go out and put a bunch of wells in and be done. It, That's it's right. kind of, and you want to do a first cut to do this, and you want to do a first cut to figure out what, what chemicals are in the ground already. Right? You want to get that background in what's the general flow pattern and what's already there before we start assessing whether somebody's done something bad. Now, I've forgotten, going, again, talking about Bob Mount, I don't know how many tests, how many drillings they made to get to the core. And, and so those are still open. So you actually could get a pretty good idea of what's there. Aren't there wells up there already? There's wells yeah. there, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So those, people, those have got, people have done that first step. Right. There's potentiometric maps and baseline information on chemistry. So your baseline is you there. You take that information, I guess I would advocate for putting the model together that takes that information and makes a, a, a rough estimate of what the, the broad picture is in the area and use that as a tool to test if your future wells are in their you know, Because many of those were not actual. They didn't they didn't do that for wells. They went down to see what the what the right. what was down there. But there are wells. Up but there. The, and but, there are but there are wells in addition to that. Yeah. But in addition to that, there are a hundred of holes that were done to find out what 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 the yeah. minerals are at what level of the minerals. A, a hole, if it's still open, you could use for the borehole geophysics. But it's not going to be a very good tool at measuring hydraulic head or chemistry because you don't know where you're collecting information averaged over a big interval. As I said, I would collect all the information you could, make some, whoever gets hired to do this would make a model, and then the next step would be to say, I think that the flow is going this way and the hydraulic head based on my model is 10, I stick my well in and it's 57, I know my model's not very right. good and I can take that information and refine it. Well, the present flow of the arsenic on the site now is on ground. It's on the ground. Is on the ground? Yeah. Well, some, of it some of it is, and yeah. I would be willing to bet some of it's under the ground. Well, I suspect so, but I mean, I, it, it's there now. Yeah. So there is contamination. That's why I said you need to do the background monitoring. Right. If there's arsenic there now, and somebody does something to the site, you know, it, it's not going to go away. So using right. typical monitoring rules probably isn't appropriate. But it, you set up a baseline, like you said, to say it's at X per parts per million, and now you do the disturbance, and it's still at X parts per million. If you had not right. set that baseline, you might say whatever the disturbance was exactly. created as no, you have data. Exactly. Where do pump tests come into play? Mm -hmm. So a, a pumping test is, um, so let's let's go back to this. So there's, four, there's the near surface geophysics, right? Somebody's gone out here. And they put little probes in the ground, and they've measured the electrical currents in the ground, and they take that and they model it, and they can come up with a distribution of layers in the subsurface. And it's going to look something like that. That doesn't really tell you what the geology is. It tells you something about the structure of the subsurface. And I guess it does tell you a little bit about the geology, but that's a really high permeability zone if you go ground, ground truth it. And this isn't. So this is a clay layer cutting across here. So that, that's where I think geophysics can be a really important tool in, in helping interpret the few points of data you're going to have with wells. Okay? So 
there's some more boral geophysics stuff. Is there a, is there a standard depth for these um, wellheads? So it would site, it would vary specific. depending on the purpose of the testing. Is that right? Because I noticed some of your uh, wells were like 200 feet. Right. Um, how do you know how far down to go? I don't think you do know. I don't think anybody's. I mean, there's how much money do you have? Okay. So <laughs> so water could start at the surface, and it could go down 200 feet, and then it could come back up again somewhere else. And it will. And it will. So it's not just a straight flow downhill. That's why I said you need to put in clusters, multiple wells at different depths. You need to and my other out. question, you said that there were a couple of reasons for wells. One was to determine flow, and the other was to determine contaminants. Now, I understand from following the discussion that we're talking about figuring out what the flow is before we decide, or before the miners decide to start digging. So can you predict? ahead of time where that water's going to go. You can put in wells and you can think, you can make an estimate of the direction that flows. You can make a chart. You can make a prediction. Um, and if you put in, like I said, how much money do you have? If you put in lots and lots of wells, but you have finite, everybody has finite resources, right? There's a limit to how many wells you can put in. So that's why this, I suggested this iterative approach. You're going to make a model. You're going to Put in wells, you're going to see if the model and the new data line up, and then from that, you're going to ex do exactly what you said. You're going to make a prediction where things are going to go, and you're going to put some monitoring wells around that predicted pathway. So, the idea with the monitoring well is that if you see it, you have to have a contingency plan to put into place before it becomes a compliance issue. Right. So, you're not putting these in uh, representative and, and going back to them once a year or once every two years. You're going back on some periodic basis to see if something's changed so that you can take the appropriate action. So if you were really please, concerned about right that, in. you could ramp up the sampling in like so. Or you could yeah, put a sensor in the well that continuously measures conductivity. pH, for instance, or conductance. In if you really wanted to spend lots of money, you could upload it to continuously to a website and have somebody monitor it, right? Yeah. Probably on a daily basis, as soon as you start seeing a trend in the data. Um, so what is the probability, I'm sure you've done enough modeling that you probably know what the probability of your modeling being accurate would be? Just a rough guess. Sure. So. I'm assuming we're talking about fractured bedrock. That is very difficult to characterize. So you're going to get a general direction. I wouldn't use the model to make a prediction. I would use the model to help design the system. The model. Then I would rely on real data to see if the thing is compromised the environment. A big sandy uniform aquifer, you can probably put in three wells and make a really good guess as to what's going in. If you're in a completely fractured, with fractures going all over the place, you're going to have, it's going to take a lot more effort to characterize those, the system to a point where you can make a really good prediction. Okay, thanks. So some of it, and then it's going to depend on how big your disturbance is, right? Yeah. If you make a small mine, it's going to be a lot different than some enormous thing. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be totally site specific. So you're going to have the craft regulations that account for that. I mean, and, and there's going to be some, somebody at some point is going to be making a judgment call. And having some kind of oversight beyond the company is <coughs> probably one way to do that. To have some advocate different groups. That's probably not the most efficient way of doing things because then people argue a lot. But, <laughs> And, and also the other questions that have been asked about uh, how permanent are wells, how often do you have to iterate. If, if a large mine is being excavated, then there's going to have to be continual testing and iterative measuring because that will change the hydraulic structure. To open up a large hole changes the entire hydraulic picture, and so you're constantly, constantly needing to monitor. If things change in terms of the three-dimensional flow field, then you may have to put a new cluster 
of monitoring wells in in order to, to cover your bases that way. And, and any any good uh, contracted company to do the hydrogeology in a large site like this, if we're talking about Bald Mountain, for example, would know would know all of this and would take those steps. And, and I'll just add that. By, I think Scott means by constantly testing while that mine's in operation, you're going to be testing. While things are changing, you're going to be testing. Once things become static again, you're, you don't, you could probably reduce the amount of testing that's done. You still want to test afterwards, but there's going to be a point where you get diminishing returns on your testing. You have more and more confidence that things aren't changing. It's really the change you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Change detection is what this is all about. And mm -hmm. you want to find it quickly and efficiently so that then you can remediate it and take action to stop it. Something's flowing into here, where's it coming from? Let's stop it. You know, that's why we've got the monitoring miles there, so that we can quickly take action to uh, to, to remediate that and move forward. And as, as just Representative Martin said, it's really critical to establish your background baseline so right. that you can differentiate between the disturbance and what you already have there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you make it a single well at a single screen. All, you, all you're measuring is a little tiny part of the subsurface. So, so the one thing we cannot do, or shouldn't do, is determine this committee determining number of wells where they should be. No. You want to put some, something a little broader. Just thought I'd ask that question. Jesus, you're damn smart. And they're not advocates one way or the other. They're just dealing with the science, and it's very much appreciated. And you I just pay your meals, and you can save my camp for nothing. We can go up there. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. I forgot. We can do what that. if I bring my well, we come back a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we come back a lot. That's right. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Andy? So many of you know uh, some of our faculty, Joe Kelly and others, who have been very actively involved over the years for uh, with coastline issues, uh, contamination issues. So anytime you need us for anything, we're, we're there. And Joe has been part of the conversations as I've come up to the university to talk about this issue too, mm -hmm. very much so. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. So why don't we take about a, a quarter to 